Happy morning, afternoon, midday, whatever time it is, everybody. I'm so glad to be back here at Def Camp in Romania. I miss this place so much, and I'm just glad to be here. So let's get started. Secrets of Social Media PsyOps, a look into how social media has been weaponized for psychological warfare with yours truly, be a PsyLab. Before I start, here's a little bit about me. I am 15 years old. I was the youngest speaker at Hope. I'm a five-time speaker at DEF CON, and I've also spoken here like three years ago or whenever the last time it was in person. I'm the founder and CEO of Girls Who Hack. Our motto is teaching girls the skills of hacking so that they can change the future. I have also started building my own end-to-end -end election system called Secure Open Vote. My election hacking from DEF CON was highlighted at a congressional hearing on election security. So a little bit more on secure open vote. I actually brought my voting reporting system here to DEF CAMP for all of you to try to hack and change the vote count. There's more information on it in the little booklet thing you all got. And you can win tons of cool prizes, so check it out. Now, back to the actual talk. Let's start off with a definition and then a little history on how it all got started. PSYOPs is short for Psychological Warfare Operations, which are military operations usually aimed at influencing the enemy's state of mind through non-combative means. These techniques are used by military and political forces to influence the beliefs, emotions, behaviors of citizens. At the end of the day, it's all marketing, but instead of a product, they are selling you an ideal. Now for some history. It was the year 329 BC, and Alexander the Great was conquering empires all around. He quickly took over large parts of Europe and the Middle East. As his army started taking over more and more land, the number of soldiers he had to defend those newfound territories started to dwindle, causing Alexander to wonder if he could keep all his newfound territory to himself. That's when Alexander the Great had a brilliant idea that would intimidate the enemy without having to do much work at all. After conquering a new city, Alexander had his armies leave behind large pieces of armor that would fit a seven foot tall giant. When the enemy soldiers passed by, they would see massive chest plates, helmets, and boots. This surely intimidated the opponents, making them wonder if they could ever win a battle against Alexander the Great's army of giants. Years later, Genghis Khan also proved that the power of intimidation could go a long way. Before attacking a city, he would send messengers ahead to tell of the horrible, huge army that was coming to attack. When the presumably huge army was approaching, all you could see was a massive dust storm coming your way. This wasn't caused by soldiers in the army, but rather by rocks and heavy objects that the horses dragged along behind them, creating the illusion of a large army. His archers also shot arrows that would whistle in the air, further intimidating the enemy. Now, we will jump ahead to World War I and World War II. Back in 1914, the Germans were the first to send pamphlets to the enemy troops. After observing how well this tactic worked, the United States decided to jump in and make some propaganda of their own. These leaflets had topics such as how successful the American troops were and how poorly the German troops were doing. Each nation used propaganda on their own citizens as well. Their goal was to get them to enlist in the military or to have them send money and supplies to the troops. In the Vietnam War, the US military played a soundtrack called Ghost Tape Number 10. And yes, this is the actual picture of the ghost tape. Someone did actually just draw that little doodle there. They did this in the Vietnamese jungles at night to persuade the troops to surrender. The U.S. forces hoped that the operation, codenamed Wandering Soul, would prey on the fears of many Vietnamese. The Vietnamese culture includes beliefs and rituals showing respect to the dead. They believe if a person is not properly buried, they will wander the earth as a wandering soul. Hence the name. Let's go to the Gulf War. 
In the Gulf War, psychological tactics were very successful because they threatened consequences to those who did not abide by the coalition's rules. The American military also promised the Iraqi troops that no harm would come to them and they would be treated very well if they surrendered. These messages were delivered by airdropping pamphlets over the battlefield. And many Iraqi troops surrendered holding that very pamphlet. Messages were also delivered by radio, as it was one of the few options the soldiers in the field had to distract themselves from the war. The Arabs also tried some PSYOPs tactics on the coalition's forces using a broadcaster by the name of Baghdad Betty. She told the soldiers that while they were off at war, their wives were at home sleeping with celebrities such as Mel Gibson, Tom Cruise, and Bart Simpson. <laughs> but wait, that's not true. The whole Bart Simpson thing was just part of a Johnny Carson monologue in the 1990s. The press changed Homer to Bart. And that comment went viral, or at least as viral as something can get in the 90s. And that comment became a fact. This illustrates why you need to fact check your media. Anyways, you may be wondering how a tiny piece of paper or a radio message can make a soldier give up all they have already sacrificed, and how warning messages can intimidate entire armies. To answer these questions, let's take a deeper look into the prior examples. Before any PSYOPs attack is used on an enemy, they're usually tired, hungry, stressed, and even depressed. This makes them even more susceptible to psychological manipulation. Additionally, all propaganda ties into one or more of the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, pride, sloth, wrath, greed, and envy. These seven sins are the greatest desires known to humankind. So avoiding these feelings in such a horrible condition is virtually impossible. Additionally, they play on the strong human emotions of anger, fear, and hate. These emotions are also the easiest to stir up in an individual. With that in mind, let's look back on Alexander the Great and why he left behind those large pieces of armor. Keep in mind, back then, the average height was much shorter than people today. Picture yourself as one of these soldiers tracking down Alexander's army and finding pieces of armor that are twice the size of yours that would definitely strike fear in your heart. Genghis Khan used the power of false numbers to his advantage as he stormed through the cities and towns. This time, imagine yourself as a soldier in a city near a dusty plain that goes on as far as the eye can see. Suddenly, you hear what you believe to be thousands of horse hooves coming your way. A huge cloud of dust appears as you watch your certain doom approaching, practically engulfing your seemingly tiny army by comparison. Again, fear was the emotion used here. In the times of World War I and World War II, you would see propaganda everywhere in your town, coming in forms such as posters, billboards, newspaper ads, and pamphlets. These posters included sayings such as, I want you for the U.S. Army, which plays on pride, and he volunteered for submarine service, which plays on lust. That covers things back home, but what about campaigns on the front lines? Because of the British blockade, getting food to Germany was virtually impossible, leaving the German troops with little rations. This gave the British the idea to send out leaflets with pictures of their soldiers eating great food and smiling brightly. Many men went to sleep hungry that night holding that leaflet. This is the perfect example of gluttony in a PSYOPs campaign. Now, picture yourself as a Vietnamese soldier walking through a dark, damp jungle in the middle of the night. You're tired, hungry, and just want to go back home to your family, who you haven't seen in weeks, when suddenly you hear the sound of your fellow soldiers who have died, their souls wandering through the jungle forever, and the eerie sounds of Buddhist funeral music, screaming, crying, and the sounds of ghosts and spirits. Let's take a listen to Wandering Soul. 
Again, you're in the jungle at night while this is playing. And you think your haunted houses are scary. At the time of the Gulf War, the U.S. sent pamphlets out to the Arabian soldiers, telling them that if they surrendered, they would treat them very well and no harm would come to them. These pamphlets were designed with the help of cooperative Iraqi prisoners of war. They advise against using the color red and to feature soldiers with bowls of fruits, including bananas. Bananas are a delicacy to the Arabians. This played on the sins of greed and gluttony. Back then, they put propaganda wherever a large number of people would see it every day, like posters at a grocery store or ads in a newspaper. These days, what is a widely used means of sharing opinions and information? Do 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 That's right, social media. 82% of U.S. citizens have a social media profile. Most likely, you have one too. Propaganda used to be a blunt tool that had to be tailored to appeal to a large general audience. With social media, ads can be targeted directly to a specific demographic. There are many social media platforms, but today we will be focusing on two of the big ones, Facebook and Twitter. Have you ever noticed that your social media ads seem to be targeting you? The other day you were looking up cupcake recipes and suddenly your Facebook feed is recommending the bake it, baking topic and ads for mixers. That is because the algorithm is targeting you by tracking your likes, searches, who you follow, and who you interact with. You also have a digital fingerprint that ties all your devices, your searches, apps, and pretty much everything you do online together. Facebook and Twitter know you better than you know yourself. The data from the algorithm helps them recommend topics and advertisements to you. If you have already done some research in modern PSYOPs, this name will be no stranger to you. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica was a political consulting firm that used large data sets to target and change the minds of voters. Though the parent company was located in Great Britain, they saw a huge opportunity in the United States. Back in 2016, consultants working for the Donald Trump's presidential campaign sought out Cambridge Analytica to help him and his campaign team. Trump's campaign spent over $44 million to run 5.9 million Facebook ads. At its peak, Cambridge Analytica was spending over $1 million a day on Facebook ads alone. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton's campaign spent $28 million on 66,000 ads. Quite a difference. All of this starts with Facebook personality surveys. Jane Baumbauer, who is professor of law at the University of Arizona, best describes how these surveys started out. In 2014, Alexander Kogan, who is a young professor at Cambridge University, made a personality quiz called This Is Your Digital Life that attempted to categorize the people who took it into a set of psychological profiles. Almost everyone who took the quiz agreed to let him access not only their public account information, all of their information, including every like, dislike, and follow, but also the profiles of their friends. That's how a few hundred thousand survey takers grew into a database of 87 million people. And even though only a few hundred thousand took the personality quiz that mapped out their psychometric profile, the researchers could use their result to build a statistical model that could then predict the psychometric profiles of the other 86 million Facebook users. The profiles were then provided to the researchers' company, Cambridge Analytica, which used them as assets to try to get political consulting clients, like Donald Trump. In 2015, 
Facebook changed its policies to restrict how third-party companies collect information from Facebook users. By the time the change was implemented, Cambridge Analytica had already received the data. Hence, it was kind of too late. They used these Facebook personality surveys to sort people in a few main categories. The survey, coupled with other Facebook data, created what is known as an OCEAN score. OCEAN, also known as the Big Five, stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Depending on your OCEAN score, they would determine if you are a persuadable, aka someone whose political views can be easily swayed. They didn't target their ads at all the persuadables. They only focused on the swing states, Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. They knew if they flipped these few states, they could win the election. In order to swing the persuadables, they created ad campaigns. One example of an ad campaign that Cambridge Analytica created was the Crooked Hillary campaign. The logo included handcuffs as the O's in Crooked, and their slogan was, Lock Her Up. Their art department would create many uncredited images and post them to Facebook. People who received these ads would not only like and share the ad, but would screenshot it and share it to other social media platforms, effectively free advertising. Cambridge Analytica created the spark, and social media became the flame, ending with the explosive 2016 election results. It is likely we will never again have free and fair elections, where candidates are sh chosen by their platform and ideas, instead of lies and fake advertising. As you can see, these ads use childish bullying tactics, such as name-calling, as well as playing on wrath, fear, and pride. Cambridge was at its high point following the 2016 elections when whistleblowers like Brittany Kaiser and Chris Wiley decided to take a stand against the company. After pleading guilty for taking people's personal data and refusing to give it back, the company declared bankruptcy and shut down for good. But this can't be the end of the story. What happened to all that data that was collected? I'm sure it wasn't simply deleted. It's no surprise that their business closing opened up a new era of disinformation for hire. Social media has the tools to sow disinformation at scale to affect anything from a small local government election to spreading disinformation about COVID-19 vaccines or even upsetting a country's elections. This can be seen today as Spanish language anti-vaccine ads are pushed on Facebook. It really makes you wonder where this disinformation is coming from and what their goal is. An example of influencing elections, Cambridge Analytica was able to flip the elections in Trinidad and Tobago. They were hired by the majority which was the Indian United National Congress Party, to defeat the incumbent People's National Movement, which primarily attracts Afro-Trambangonian voters. They researched both audiences and decided to target the young voters. They knew the young Indian UNC voters would do what their parents told them to do, and they would go out and vote for the UNC. So they focused their efforts on the Afro-Trambangonian voters. They created a campaign called Do So to increase apathy towards voting and politics in general, encouraging them not to vote. Did this tactic work? Yes, it did. The United National Congress Party won the election. In case you are thinking this is recent news, this happened back in 2010, meaning that this sort of election manipulation has been going on for a long time. Besides creating campaigns and posting to social media, these private firms offer the ultimate power in disinformation campaigning. Deniability. Governments and political figures can contract these disinformation companies to do their dirty work, making it very difficult to trace it back to the source. 
Content farms produce thousands of legitimate looking accounts, complete with an untraceable, unique profile picture and a posting history. The bonus is real people spread these conspiracies and lies by sharing and reposting on multiple platforms, giving a huge return on a relatively small investment. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Donald Trump has been doing this even before he was out of office. He told his constituents that if he didn't win the election, it was rigged, conditioning his followers to rise up if he did not win. Once the election results were certified and Joe Biden was declared the winner, Trump started claiming the election was rigged, stirring up wrath in his followers, leading to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Trump still tells this lie that the election was rigged despite the total lack of evidence, yet his followers believe it. The underlying message to his followers is, if you don't win something, it's because it was stolen from you. Cambridge Analytica wasn't the only one persuading voters in the U.S. Russian actors also use social media to cause havoc and divide the country. Why in the world would Russia do this? Unlike Cambridge Analytica, they are not out to gain money, but rather power. Soviet Premier Khrushchev said, we do not have to invade the United States. We will destroy you from within. That is exactly what Russia is doing, dividing the country so it destroys itself from within. The Russian actors created Facebook accounts and groups, as well as Twitter bots, all impersonating US citizens in organized groups. One example of this is South United. As you can see right here, this ad was paid for in rubles. You can also see the interest tags they used. Take a look at some of them. Stop illegal immigration, Christianity, Mike Pence, Trump Jr., politics, Fox News. People who follow these accounts also like and repost the content. One of the ad tools on Facebook allows you to send ads to friends and people you follow. You can then pick from thousands of different keywords, targeting even more interest groups. The Russians also make fake news websites that appear to be real news sources, but are actually fake. When Bob goes on Facebook and reads an article on how Hillary is crooked, he probably won't check where it came from, but he will like and repost it, and so that all his friends can do the same. The younger audience may be thinking, yeah, of course it's fake, I can tell that. But you have to understand that the older audience, not trying to target anyone, was brought up believing all news sources are fully fact-checked. They have applied this belief to all modern delivery platforms. After all, Facebook is where I connect with my friends and family. Why would Facebook lie to me? This news article must be real because the site it's on looks real. Turns out this newspaper's mailing address is in a shopping mall between Forever 21 and Claire's. There's also a building in Washington, D.C. that is full of mailboxes. This gives any blogger living in his parents' basement the ability to list legitimate sounding physical addresses at the bottom of his news site, making it seem even more realistic. An interesting fact is that the Russians target both sides, not just one like Cambridge did. This way, they can divide and conquer. In the US, Russian influence reached over 126 million people through Facebook alone. They created fake Black Lives Matter memes that when you clicked on them, you were taken to pages inviting you to a protest. At the same time, they were targeting adversary groups like Blue Lives Matter with similar fake pages inviting them to a protest at the same location on the same day. The Russian government is organizing face-to-face -face protests in order to get us to fight with each other and divide the country. So far, we have talked about Facebook. But when you think about political discussions, your mind goes straight to the dumpster fire that is Twitter. <laughs> Just like Facebook, Twitter is used by Russians and other groups to sow disinformation to the American populace. Many using the same techniques that are used on Facebook. 
One big problem with Twitter is the low bar for entry. This allows groups to use tools that create many bot accounts very quickly. These accounts go and tweet the same things. Once the bot gets caught and blocked, they simply create a new batch of accounts. The Twitter bots also retweet other bots' tweets, as is shown in this beautiful graphic by Daniel Gallagher. Going back to the seven deadly sins and lust, the bot accounts frequently feature beautiful young women because the target audience is primarily male voters. Take this account for example. These photos were stolen off a Colombian Instagram influencer's account. You've had some history and some examples. Now let's walk through a PSYOPs campaign together. For this campaign, let's say Elon Musk is coming to Romania for Halloween. Oh wait, that's already been done before. Oops. So let's come up with something new. There are six basic steps to a PSYOPs campaign. Plan, target audience, series development, product design, dissemination, and evaluation. For our example, I will be combining some of these steps together for the sake of time. First is planning. In this phase, you determine your goal and who your target audience is. For our example, the objective will be convincing Bob that unicorns are real. So let's call this Operation Twilight. For any operation, it helps to give your target audience an individual identity. This makes the series development and product design much easier. That's why we have created Bob. Not trying to target anyone named Bob. Next, we refine our target audience. We chose Bob, but who is Bob? We picked Bob because he does many Facebook personality surveys, and through those, we found out he was a persuadable. He's also very active online with his friends. This will be a force multiplier to our operation. Now that we have our objective and our target audience, let's move on to series development and product design. I put these two together because they pretty much happen hand in hand during an operation. Though it seems logical, we can't just make an ad that says, unicorns are real, and be done. Bob will laugh at it and move on, much like you guys would. It has nothing to do with his interests. What we need to do is slowly pull Bob through a series of targeted ads and psyops that convince him unicorns are real. First, we'll send out some articles from our fake online newspaper that is made to look like a legitimate popular site. The article talks about how scientists have managed to splice the DNA of a narwhal with the DNA of a horse, causing horses to grow a horn. This article will have links to our scientific journal with more articles on how DNA splicing works, complete with the case study of unicorn gene splicing. We can also add legitimate sounding scientific names and quotes. How did we create this fancy looking thing? We found some random scientific journal thingy online and replaced some of the words with horse and unicorn. It's easy. Soon after these, similar articles will be posted. One being on how scientists have managed to manipulate the horn DNA to determine its length, allowing our unicorns to have a more normal looking horn. Next, our art department will generate pictures of unicorns. And since Bob is a bit of a conspiracy nut, we will make them look as if the pictures come from surveillance camera footage and hidden camera shots. Bob will love this and share these photos with his friends. His friends, who share similar interests with him, believe it, but others are more skeptical. When his friends laugh at him, he will simply share the links to our newspaper and scientific journals, causing many of them to join Bob as a unicorn convert. Dissemination. Dissemination has been happening through Facebook ads that look like legitimate news articles. We can also credit a scientific podcast, which interviews the scientists who made the unicorn. Again, all fake. This podcast will be supported by our numerous fake Twitter and Instagram accounts we are using to spread photos of our unicorn. Finally, we evaluated our operation. Turns out it worked. Not only did we convince Bob that unicorns were real, he also used our propaganda to convince his friends they were real. As a bonus, Bob started a blog about unicorns, further spreading the message. 
Today, you got some history, some psyops, and a heavy dose of reality. But this is a ton of information. If only there was a project or a tool out there that can help me navigate this scary world. I present to you, Tanbe. It, Tanbe is a collaboration between Qatar's Computing Research Institute, MIT's CSAIL, and Bulgaria's Sofia University. This project uses AI to analyze news articles and other media sources to see how biased they are, what their political alignment is, and whether or not they are generating propaganda. Like anything, the results you obtain from their tools should be used with other research to determine the factuality of a media source. We'll be focusing on their news aggregator and their article analysis tool. They also have other tools you can explore if you are interested, as shown here. They also have a few publications under their name, in case you want to do some research on them. It's not that many publications, though, I'm sorry. Yeah, just a few publications, that's all. Let's talk about their news source tool. Their news source tool allows you to go on popular news sites and get an analysis on them. So let's look at CNN. First, it will give you a Wikipedia description of what CNN is. It will show its centrality and its hyperpartisanship. Then it will show its likelihood to have propaganda. As you can see, it's very unlikely, which is really good. Next, it will show you what topics they carry on. So they talk a lot about cultural identity, political topics, and economical topics. Then it will give you analysis on how factual it is, or, well, how likely it is to be factual. And it's very likely, which is good. Next, it shows its political leaning. As you can see, it's a very left center. Then it shows its target audience, which is liberal. A cool thing is it also shows you its Twitter bias, which is far left or left. Then it goes on and shows the different topics that agrees and disagrees on and how much it does. This one's on climate change. They also have one on Brexit, alternative energy, immigration, death penalty, and more. They also have it for Fox News, as shown here. Its centrality is lower. How likely um, it is to have propaganda is also not as likely. Um, the factuality of reporting is more mixed, a little scary. And here you can see its political ideology. It's interesting that the AI put Fox News as both left, center, and right. As you can see, its target audience is very conservative, no surprise there. And it's Twitter bias. Far right on everything. <laughs> okay, but that's about the news sites. What about the actual articles themselves? Next, we will look at their article analysis tool. You have the option to just paste the URL to a site or copy the text from the article in the tool. We found it best to use the text option, as using the URL will also put in the search engine optimization keywords and skew the results a little. For this sample, we grabbed a random article from Fox News. First, it shows its bias analysis of that article, and it shows that it's leaning more right. It shows its propaganda score. And then it goes on to the actual article itself, and it highlights some key words or phrases that it finds. And it highlights them based on colors, going with all the things you can see on the right, which I will zoom into. There you go. And it talks about this and flags them off. So like if it has exaggeration, bandwagon, loaded language, slogans, name calling, doubt, oversimplification, etc. 
and over here it can show you the probability that it is factual, going from the most probable to the least. Okay, that tool is cool, but what else can I do? One, you can install an ad blocker. This way you only get feed and not targeted information. Two, don't take any online quizzes or surveys. I know it's tempting to find out what flavor of ice cream you are, but it's best not to give out personal information, as simple or minor as it may seem. Three, when reading an article, always check the sources and who wrote it. Don't forget to compare it with other articles from trusted sites. And last but not least, four, always make sure to fact check everything you see and read and never base your opinion on just one thing and learn what both sides have to say before forming an opinion for yourself. Even though social media can be a scary place, it can also be educational and a lot of fun. You just need to balance it with reality. Go outside, touch some grass, get some fresh air. And with that, I'm BSI Lab, and you can follow me on these social media sites. Thank you. <laughs>